I remember the day I met James as if it were yesterday. I was sitting in a small, slightly run-down cafe, nestled in the corner by the fogged-up window. It was one of those places where the decor hadn't changed since the late 70s, faded wallpaper, kitschy neon signs, and all. I was nursing the cheapest cup of coffee they offered, its bitter taste a stark contrast to the overly sweet pastries displayed under a dusty cover. The steam from the cup fogged up my glasses as I sat there, lost in the whirlwind of my thoughts, trying to piece together my scattered plans for the future. The bell above the door chimed, a quaint, jangling sound that seemed overly cheerful for such a dreary morning. That's when he walked in. It was like a scene straight out of a movie, only there were no dramatic lights, no mood-setting music, just the mundane sounds of a busy cafe, the clink of cups, the murmur of conversations, and the occasional hiss from the espresso machine. The scent of stale coffee hung heavy in the air, now mixed with the sharp, unmistakable smell of his aftershave. Is this seat taken? He asked, his voice smooth, almost rehearsed, as he gestured to the chair opposite mine. There was a hint of a smile playing on his lips, the kind that could easily knock someone off their feet if they weren't careful. It looks free to me. I managed to reply, my words laced with a casualness I didn't quite feel. My heart was racing, and I was desperately hoping I didn't sound as flustered as I felt. He sat down, and that simple act seemed to shift the entire atmosphere of the cafe. We started talking, and damn, it was like we were cut from the same cloth. James had a way of speaking that made you feel like you were the only person in the room. He was interested in all the things I was, from binge-watching the same trashy series to having heated debates about the best pizza topping. It's pineapple, fight me, he declared with a mock serious tone, sparking an animated discussion that somehow ended with both of us laughing until our sides hurt. Fast forward a bit, and we were dating. It wasn't just casual meetups. This was the real deal. It felt like I'd known him my entire life. Conversations about our favorite movies and childhood memories blended seamlessly into discussions about our future. Before we knew it, we were talking about getting hitched. That's when the drama started. His parents, let me tell you, were something else. The first time I met them, it felt like walking into a lion's den wearing a meat dress. They had this manner of smiling that didn't quite reach their eyes, sizing you up as they did so, deciding whether you were worthy of their time or not. So, you're the girl James can't stop yapping about, his mom said, her voice dripping with a tone that was definitely not warmth. Guilty as charged, I shot back, trying my best not to let her see that she got to me. They laid down the law pretty quick, telling us we needed to sign a prenup. Now, I'm no gold digger, and I sure as hell didn't need anyone's money, but that rubbed me the wrong way. I agreed to sign their prenup, but not without laying down a condition of my own. If one of us cheats, the cheater pays up $150,000, I declared, staring them down as I spoke. James looked as if I'd slapped him with a fish. Babe, I'd never cheat on you, he said, his eyes wide and earnest. Yeah, well, my ex said the same thing before I caught him with his pants down, literally. So, it's this or nothing. He agreed, and so did his parents, though they looked as if they'd swallowed lemons. We thought that was the end of it, but boy, were we wrong. One evening, we were cuddled up on our old rickety couch, a tradition we had started since moving in together. The couch squeaked with every movement, and we swore we'd replace it, but never did because it had somehow become our spot. The TV droned on in the background, but we weren't watching. We were too busy making plans for a trip to Italy, a trip we knew we couldn't afford, but were determined to make happen. James, think about it. The food, the wine, the art. We have to go, I said, my eyes sparkling with excitement. James laughed, tightening his arm around me. Ava, babe, you had me at food. But let's face it, our bank account is more camping in the backyard than romantic getaway to Venice.
I playfully nudged him. So, we'll save. We'll cut back on, I don't know, things we don't need. Like your video games. He feigned horror. Not the video games. Take my shirts, my shoes, even my beloved coffee maker, but leave the games alone. We laughed, but that was us. Always dreaming big, yet grounded in the reality of our modest lives. We didn't care. We were happy. Our happiness wasn't just found in the big moments, but in the little ones too, like how James would make breakfast on Saturdays. He couldn't cook to save his life, but he had somehow mastered the art of scrambled eggs and toast, which he'd serve with a side of his terrible coffee. Those mornings with James were something special. Hey, I'm thinking scrambled eggs today. What do you think? He'd ask, already making his way to the kitchen with a determined look that suggested he was ready to conquer the culinary world, one breakfast at a time. Only if you promise not to burn the toast this time, I'd call out, half teasing, half serious, followed by, and I'm making the coffee. We both knew that his attempts at brewing coffee were less than stellar, leading to concoctions that tasted more like tar than anything found in a coffee shop. One day, as we were cleaning up after one of our usual hearty breakfasts, hands sudsy with soap as we washed the dishes together, James broached a topic we had danced around for months. It was one of those mundane tasks that felt special simply because we were doing it together, turning an everyday chore into a shared ritual. Ava, we need to talk about, you know, starting a family, James said, breaking the comfortable silence that had settled between us. His words hung in the air, and I paused, a plate in hand, the soapy water dripping back into the sink with a soft plop. I sighed. I know, it's just, it's scary, isn't it? What if we can't? What if it doesn't happen for us? The fear of the unknown, of potential disappointment, was palpable in my voice. James turned to me, drying his hands on a towel. Then we'll deal with it together. But we won't know until we try, right? I mean, how hard can it be? His attempt at lightening the mood with a laugh did little to ease the tension. Famous last words, babe. I replied, a nervous laugh escaping me too. But that was how it was with us. No matter what we faced, we faced it together. Even when his mom, Helen, started dropping not-so-subtle hints about grandchildren every chance she got, we took it in stride. Ava, darling, when are you going to give me some grandbabies? You're not getting any younger, you know. She'd say, her voice sweet, but her message anything but. I'd bite my tongue, smile, and respond with as much grace as I could muster. We're working on it, aren't we, James? And he'd jump in, yeah, mom, lay off, will you? These things take time. But as the year went on, the pressure started to build, not just from Helen, but from within ourselves. We wanted a family— but it wasn't happening as easily as we had hoped. Meanwhile, Helen found her new hobby, making my life a living hell. Our home turned into a battleground, and her main weapon was her sharp tongue. It wasn't just about the occasional jib anymore. It was an all-out war with daily assaults on my self-esteem and my role as a wife. It all spiraled one Sunday lunch, a day that was supposed to be laid back and peaceful. Helen with her uncanny timing, dropped by uninvited just as we were about to sit down. The air was tense the moment she walked in, her eyes scanning the room like she was about to conduct a military inspection. Well, isn't this quaint? She started, her voice dripping with sarcasm as she looked at the modest spread I'd prepared. You really outdid yourself, Ava. I can see you've been slaving away in the kitchen all morning. Her eyes briefly met mine, a smirk playing at the corners of her mouth. Trying to keep the peace, I forced a smile. It's nothing fancy, Helen, just something simple and quick. Please have a seat. As we sat down, the barrage began in earnest. You know, Ava, Helen said, loading her voice with condescension. I was talking to Mrs. Henderson the other day, and she mentioned how her grandson was just born. It got me thinking, when are you and James going to give me some good news? 
It's not like you're getting any younger. I felt my cheeks burn, a mix of embarrassment and anger swelling inside me. I glanced at James, hoping for some support, but he was suddenly very interested in his plate. Mom, come on. James finally muttered, but it was half-hearted, and we all knew it. Helen plowed on, relentless. And James, dear, I don't mean to be cruel, but you're not a charity. You work hard for your money. Why waste it on Ava if she can't do her basic duties as a wife? A cleaning service and a cook would be much more efficient, don't you think? That's when I couldn't hold it back any longer. Helen, I am trying my best here. It's not like I don't want to have kids. And as for the house and my cooking, well, I didn't realize marriage was a service contract. Helen scoffed. Well, it's not a free ride either. You have responsibilities, Ava, which you are clearly not fulfilling. The room was heavy with tension, and I could feel the tears pricking at the back of my eyes. But what hurt the most wasn't Helen's words. It was James's silence. He finally spoke up, but it wasn't to defend me. Yeah, mom has a point. Maybe we should consider getting some help around here. Would make things easier for you, too. Easier for me? His words felt like a betrayal. It was clear I was on my own in this. Over the next few days, Helen's visits became more frequent, and with each visit, her criticism grew sharper. She'd inspect the house, pointing out every speck of dust or a pillow out of place. You call this clean, she'd scoff. My eyes must be deceiving me because this looks like a pigsty. Then came the comments about my appearance. Is that what you're wearing? You know, a wife should dress to please her husband. It's no wonder James is always so tired. He has to come home to this. I tried to fight back. Helen, I don't dress for James. I dress for myself. And he's always so tired because he works hard, not because of what I wear. But it was like talking to a brick wall. Helen had made up her mind about me, and nothing I said or did would change it. James's stance, or lack thereof, was the biggest blow. Each night after his mom's departure, I felt more alone than ever. We'd argue more frequently as the days went by. Why won't you stand up for me, James? She's walking all over us, and you're just letting her. I'd say, my voice tinged with frustration and hurt. Ava, she's old, set in her ways. What do you want me to do? Kick my own mom out. James's tone was exasperated, his plea for understanding almost desperate. No, but I want you to be my husband, to stand by me, not her, I replied sharply. The air between us was charged with tension. The issue at hand was no longer just about Helen's disapproval. It was about us, our marriage, and whether we were strong enough to stand together or let Helen's criticisms tear us apart. As the days turned into weeks, I realized that this wasn't just a phase. It was a full-blown siege. If we didn't do something soon, there might not be anything left to save. The atmosphere at home had grown icy since Helen ramped up her campaign of critique, and it wasn't just our home life that was feeling the strain. James himself had started acting weird, and not in a he's-just-stressed-at-work kind of way. It was something else something that made my stomach twist in knots. It started with the phone calls. James had always been pretty open about his phone. We didn't keep secrets from each other. But then, he started stepping out of the room every time he got a call, and it was always the same caller ID, John Work. Who's John Work? I asked one evening, trying to keep my voice casual. James flinched, a telltale sign that he was on edge. Oh, just a new guy at the office. Lots of questions, you know. But it didn't stop there. James, who was as far from a fashionista as you could get, suddenly started caring about his appearance. Gone were the days of graphic tees and worn-out jeans. Now it was all crisp shirts, slacks, and cologne. He was using cologne now. Since when did he care about smelling like a department store? What's with the new look? Got a job interview or something. I joked one morning, 
watching him comb his hair in a way I'd never seen before. He just smirked a little too quickly. Just felt like changing things up. No harm in that, right? And the late nights at work, they were becoming a regular thing. Another long one, babe. I'd text, trying not to sound too needy. Sorry, um, this project is killing me. Won't be late, I promise. He'd text back. But the clock would tick well past midnight before I heard his keys in the door. I tried to shake the feeling that something was off, but it clung to me like a shadow. That's when I decided to hire a private detective. It felt like something out of a bad TV show, but I had to know for sure. The evidence came in a plain brown envelope. The contents, as damning as they were heartbreaking. Photos of James with another woman, their intimacy undeniable, captured in frozen moments that shattered our years together. But it was the recording that cut the deepest. Their conversations, filled with endearments and plans, left no room for doubt. They were in love, or at least he was with her. I sat there, the evidence spread out in front of me, a cold realization settling in. This was it. This was the proof that could anchor me in a stormy divorce, should it come to that. Photos that caught moments stolen from our life together and words that betrayed every I love you he had ever whispered in my ear. But I kept it all a secret, a painful burden I chose to carry alone. I wasn't ready to confront him, not yet. I needed a plan, a way to navigate the wreckage of our marriage with my dignity intact. The following days were a blur. James continued his charade, and I played along, the perfect wife with a smile plastered on my face and a heart breaking silently. Our conversations became a dance around the truth, each word measured, every laugh forced. Everything okay, eh? You've been quiet, James would ask, his concerns seemingly genuine. Yeah, just tired, you know. Work's been crazy, I'd reply, the lie tasting bitter on my tongue. It was just another mundane day, or so I thought, until I stumbled upon a conversation that would change everything. There I was, passing by the slightly ajar door to James's office. When their voices caught my attention, it was like stumbling upon a scene from a dramatic play, except this was all too real and the stakes were personal. It was James and his mother, Helen, and their conversation was far from the idle chit-chat one might expect between family members. The tone was serious, heavy with intent, and I hesitated at the door, my hand pausing mid-knock. I'm telling you, Mom, I can't do this anymore. It's not just about the kids. I've lost all feeling for Ava. It's like we're roommates, not husband and wife. James's voice, strained and tired, floated through the gap. Helen's response came sharp and cutting. Well, of course, you feel that way. She's not given you a child, and let's be honest, what else has she brought to this marriage? But let's not be hasty, my 65th birthday is coming up, and we wouldn't want to miss out on a generous gift from her, now would we? The cynicism in her voice was like a knife twisting in my gut. They were plotting against me, using me until they deemed it convenient to throw me aside. And after we get a nice, expensive gift, we can kick her to the curb, right? James said, his voice cold and calculating. Exactly, dear. Just bide your time a little longer, Helen confirmed, her voice dripping with malice. I stood there, rooted to the spot, a mix of shock and anger boiling inside me. They were planning my exit from this family as casually as one would plan a grocery list. The hurt was deep, but it sparked something else in me, a burning desire for revenge. They thought they could use me, discard me at their convenience. I'd show them I wasn't just some pawn in their twisted game. A few days later, during a family dinner that felt more like a farce than a meal, Helen brought up her upcoming birthday with the same smirk that I had come to despise. She leaned in and asked, So, Ava, dear, what are you planning for my birthday? Something special, I hope. I met her gaze, my face a mask of calm. Actually, Helen, I was thinking of throwing you a dinner at the city's most luxurious restaurant. 
a night you won't forget. Her eyes lit up with greed, and she exchanged a quick, satisfied look with James. They thought they had me cornered, but little did they know I was already two steps ahead. Oh, Ava, that sounds delightful. Just close family, you know, keep it intimate, Helen said, her voice oozing fake sweetness. Of course, Helen. It'll be our pleasure, I replied, the words tasting like ash in my mouth. The weeks leading up to Helen's 65th birthday felt like a slow march towards D-Day. Every smirk from her, every indifferent shrug from James, fueled my resolve. The plan was simple yet bold, just like the movies. Host a lavish dinner at the city's most luxurious restaurant under the guise of a loving gesture, then drop the bombshell. But like any good plot, the devil was in the details. The night before the party, the tension at home was palpable. James, oblivious to the storm brewing, was casually lounging on the couch, scrolling through his phone. Everything's set for tomorrow, he asked, not looking up. Oh, you could say that, I replied, my tone belying the turmoil inside. The day arrived, and as guests started to fill the opulent dining room reserved for Helen's celebration, the air was thick with anticipation. My heart raced, not from nerves, but from the adrenaline of what was about to unfold. Helen, ever the queen bee, basked in the attention, lavishing in the luxury of her surroundings. Oh, Ava, you've outdone yourself. This place is exquisite, she exclaimed, her voice loud enough for nearby tables to hear. As we all settled in, the meal proceeded with the kind of forced civility that one might expect at a diplomatic summit rather than a family gathering. Each course was a testament to the restaurant's culinary prowess, but the real main dish was yet to be served, the revelation that would shake the very foundations of our faux idyllic family tableau. As James's bitter words filled the air, I stood there in the doorway, my resolve as unwavering as the posture I maintained. Helen, standing beside him, seemed equally shocked and irritated by my presence. Her glare was intense, a clear attempt to intimidate, but I had moved beyond the reach of their emotional manipulations. You've got some nerve showing up here after last night, James spat out, his face a mix of anger and disbelief. The weight of his gaze and the harshness of his tone were meant to unnerve me, but they only solidified my determination. I had prepared for this moment, armed not just with legal documents, but with the clarity that comes from having nothing left to lose. I came to collect the rest of my things and to deliver these, I said, holding up the divorce papers with a steady hand. My voice was calm, devoid of the turmoil that had churned within me just days before. Consider it a formality, James. As for nerve, I think I've shown more than enough of it living with you and Helen's manipulations. Helen's face turned a shade redder, her lips parting as if to hurl another insult or perhaps deny the vile tactics they'd employed. But before she could get a word out, I continued, and as for the bill last night, I trust you've managed to sort that out? After all, I am no longer part of this family, as you so keenly pointed out. James looked from me to Helen, his confusion evident. The realization that I had blocked the shared account and left them to fend for themselves was dawning on him slowly, and with it, the understanding of the full extent of my departure from their lives. This isn't over, Ava. You can't just walk away and think there won't be consequences, James said, his voice low and menacing. I expect there will be consequences, I replied, meeting his gaze firmly. For both of us. But I am prepared to face mine. Are you? I let the question hang in the air, a challenge laid bare between us. Helen, who had been momentarily silenced, found her voice again. You think you're clever, don't you? Leaving us with that bill. Cutting off the accounts. You're vindictive. Perhaps I've learned from the best. I shot back with a cold smile. But I'm not here to argue or settle scores beyond what's legal and right. I'm here to finalize the end of an agreement that should have ended long ago. With that, I placed the divorce papers on the nearby table, my movements deliberate. 
You'll find everything in order there. My lawyer will be in touch with the specifics. Turning to leave, I felt a strange mixture of relief and emptiness. The apartment that had once been a home now felt like just another room, filled with memories best left behind. As I picked up the last of my boxes, I felt the final ties to my old life slipping away. You'll regret this, Ava. Helen called out as I reached the door, her voice a mix of anger and desperation. Maybe, I said without turning around. But I doubt it. With that, I stepped out into the new day, the morning light casting long shadows behind me, the door closing with a definitive click. The chapter of my life involving James and Helen was closed, sealed not just by the signing of papers, but by the liberating act of walking away from a toxic past. As I walked away from the house for the last time, the air seemed clearer, the burden of the past finally lifted. I was free to rebuild, to find peace, and perhaps one day, to trust and love again without reservation. This wasn't just an end, it was a beginning. Helen, ever the viper, was quick to add her venom. Ungrateful wretch, you've embarrassed us in front of the whole city. Do you know how humiliating it was to have the police calm me down? People were laughing, filming. I met their fury with a calm I didn't truly feel. Embarrassed? You think that's your biggest problem right now? I tossed the divorce papers on the table, the photos of James's infidelity on top. You should be more concerned with this. The color drained from James's face as he picked up the photos, his mother peering over his shoulder. Their outrage turned to shock, then to panic, as they realized the extent of what I had. And let's not forget the prenup, shall we? I continued, my voice steady. You cheat, you pay. $150,000 to be exact. Helen's face twisted into a snarl. You wouldn't dare. You can't do this to us. Oh, but I can and I will. My tone was cold, final. James, the reality of the situation finally dawning on him, switched tactics. Em, please, let's talk about this. We can fix it. I couldn't help but laugh, bitter and hard. Fix it? You think you can just undo everything with a few words? No, James, it's done. Helen, ever the manipulator, tried to soften her approach, her voice dripping with feigned concern. Ava, darling, think about what you're doing. This will ruin us. That ship has sailed, Helen. You should have thought about that before. The begging turned to pleading, their words a desperate scramble to salvage what they could, but my mind was made up. I was done being the victim, done with their lies and manipulations. In the end, James had no choice but to borrow the money from his parents to pay me. As I left that house for the last time, check in hand, I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. After everything went down, I used the payout from James to put a down payment on a small but cozy place of my own. It's funny, you know, how much peace you can find in the walls of a place that's just yours, where every nook feels like a sanctuary from the chaos of the past. Life's quieter now, and I like it that way. I've got a job that keeps me busy, neighbors who nod and smile, and a little garden that's all mine to tend to. But every once in a while, the grapevine tosses a juicy bit my way about James and Helen. Just the other day, I was grabbing coffee from the corner spot where locals hang, and I bumped into someone from the old neighborhood. After the usual pleasantries, they leaned in, voice dropping to a conspiratorial whisper. Hey, have you heard about the latest drama with your ex and his mom? They asked, eyes gleaming with the thrill of gossip. I couldn't help but raise an eyebrow, a mix of curiosity and detachment taking hold. Can't say that I have. Do tell. Well, they started, clearly savoring the moment. It seems Helen's not too pleased with James's new girlfriend. Word is they've been at it like cats and dogs. Makes your situation look like a walk in the park. The conversation moved on, but as I walked away, coffee in hand, I couldn't shake the feeling of utter relief. 
There was a time when news like that would have sent me spiraling, but now, now it was just another piece of someone else's story.